what sets English for academic purposes apart from general language study is its focus on specific purposeful uses of language. So specific purposes texts um, use what Alistair Cummings once uh, called context reduced language, which tends to be abstract and less reliant on an immediate context for its coherence. EAP students are studying English for a particular practical need, um, which is why researchers study target language features and teachers focus on these features in their classrooms. Now, this attention to specificity has shaped the field's strong research orientation. It's also led to the sharpening of, of key uh, concepts in applied linguistics, such as genre, authenticity, um, discourse community, communicative purpose and audience. But while specificity is central to most definitions of EAP, there's still a lot of discussion about um, how specific we should be. So what kind of English should we be teaching? Should we focus on the kind of general academic uh, language that's transferable across disciplines or um, tailor our instruction to particular disciplinary needs? And there are arguments on both sides. So the general EAP people argue that English teachers lack the knowledge and expertise to teach specific um, uh, discipline specific varieties. So this was uh, Ruth Spack's argument back in the 1980s. Others say that EAP is too hard for low proficiency students, that you've got to um, give them a good grounding in general English before that. Um, there's also an argument that subject specific skills relegates EAP to a low status service industry uh, supporting the faculties. So this was um, Henry Woodison's argument a long time ago, uh, where he said that EAP was not education, but training. It was it was it was too specific to be education. And um, the fourth argument is that, that there are gener generic uh, common core features which are uh, the same across all uh, disciplines. So Hutchison and Waters' famous uh, book ESP back in 1987 claimed that there are insufficient variations in the grammar functions or discourse structures of different disciplines to justify subject specificity. Now, in contrast to all this, the um, ESAP people um, say that subject teachers lack the uh, expertise and the desire to teach uh, literacy skills. They're just not interested in, in language. The students don't learn best by studying general features before specific ones, but it's more efficient to focus on the things that they need rather than a lot of um, peripheral stuff that they might never use. There are also problems about identifying what a common core might be for an academic, uh, a general academic purposes course. We took, we, there's a, a lot of discussion about what that should include. And um, thirdly, uh, fourthly, that the specific EAP elevates the importance and the status of literacy specialists and centers because it demonstrates to the university that we know what we're talking about, that we've done our research, that we are interested and understand uh, their, the language of their disciplines. So there are arguments for both EGAP and ESAP. Um, and of course, the context is going to be important here. For example, what do we know about the students? What are their um, uh, priorities? Have they selected a major yet? Or are they transitioning uh, from school to university English? What do we know about the text that they, that they need to use? So certainly there are some register level uh, features which are useful to students, um, but I've always been a big fan of, of getting as close uh, uh, to what students actually need as possible. Specificity then recognises that 
academic conventions differ enormously across disciplines. And so identifying the particular language features, discourse practices, and communicative skills of uh, target groups becomes central to teaching English at universities. So that a uh, rather long-winded introduction. That's my topic for today. I'm going to start with um, a few words about discipline and writing, and then uh, go on to um, argue for specificity, drawing on some of my earlier research. Discipline, of course, is a hard term to pin down, um, but it's now important in EAP as we become more sensitive to the ways that genres are used uh, by members of uh, social groups. So ideas like communicative competence in applied linguistics, situated learning in education, social constructionism in the social sciences, all contribute to a view which puts community at the heart of language and speech. So specificity then results from the fact that we communicate um, as members of social groups and that different groups use language to construct their business, uh, define their boundaries, manage their interactions in particular ways. So this view focuses on the importance of, of communicating and learning to communicate as an insider. So identifying the particular ways that insiders have to talk about reality. Now, I think it's important then that students understand really that writing uh, at university is very different from writing at school. Um, it's not about personal opinion essays or grammar practice. That's not uh, uh, the object of the game anymore. We need students to take responsibility for clarity in their writing and to give them the resources that they need to do this. So this means helping them to see that academic writing in English, unlike a lot of um, uh, languages and, and different registers, tends to be more explicit about its structure and its purpose. So say what you're going to say, say it, and then say what you've said. It uses more citations to support arguments. It focuses on actions rather than actors. It uses fewer rhetorical questions than students might uh, use at school. It's generally intolerant of digressions. It's cautious in making claims. It packages processes as things, and it spells out uh, the steps in an argument and connections between sentences very explicitly. So this means introducing students to tools like nominalization, impersonalization, hedging, connectives, meta discourse, citation, and so on. And this brings us to uh, specificity and um, offering students a discipline sensitive approach to English. I'm going to give you some evidence for the importance of specificity from four very different sources, looking at Lexis, genre features, tutor expectations, and student assignments. Now, perhaps the most obvious example of uh, specificity um, is Lexis, that, that, that um, disciplines have different ways of talking about the world. They name and describe things in different ways. And this makes it very difficult to identify a common academic vocabulary. So this is a, a, um, a quick study of content words from five um, from chapters in five introductory university textbooks in uh, linguistics and biology. And we can see that students encounter completely different items. These are different worlds, um, different ways of, of understanding things and talking about things. Less obviously than content words um, are the semi-technical items that often differ by discipline. So um, analyzing a corpus of 4 million, an academic corpus of over 4 million words, Polly Tsai and I a few years ago, found that high frequency, so-called universal um, items on Coxhead's academic word list have very different frequencies and preferred uh, meanings in different fields. So for example, means consist, means stay the same, 
in the social sciences and composed of in the sciences. Volume means book in applied linguistics and quantity in biology. Um, abstract means remove in engineering and theoretical in the social sciences. So words which, which look the same have different meanings across fields. They're polysemious and they also have different frequencies. Looking at specific vocabulary then, we have word lists for a whole range of different fields, um, engineering, aviation, business trades, uh, medicine, and so on. One example is Althea Haar's study of a six million word corpus from economics and finance. And here we looked, um, we found 837 words which had a meaning specific to these two fields. Many of these words, however, often had a general everyday meaning, which were very different from their specialized meaning. So words like asset, risk, interest, income, we use um, uh, as everyday terms, but they have specific meanings in these uh, fields. And this can create confusion for students and, and, and for everybody else. Vocabulary can also differ across disciplines in the same field. So Ward and Muang's study um, compared items in textbooks from five engineering fields, and they found that gas, heat and liquid were terms which occurred almost exclusively in chemical engineering, not in the other engineering fields. They did find that items like system, uh, time, value and factor were very high across all engineering fields. But looking more closely, they found that they collocated very differently. So they combined with other words to give them highly specific um, uh, technical meanings, like settling time, um, critical uh, value, load factor, which was specific to the fields. Paul Thompson also found uh, similar variations in the distributions of the top uh, 20 content words in the uh, British Academic Spoken English lecture corpus. So 60% uh, of occurrences of economy were in the uh, social sciences, 65% of vary in the physical sciences, and 50% of respond in the life sciences. So thinking about specificity of Lexis, um, we can, you know, we can help students by more accurately targeting the things that they actually need. Now, rhetorical choices also vary uh, across disciplines because they express different epistemological and social practices. So students learn their disciplines as they learn its discourses. Now, I don't have time here to um, discuss disciplines in detail, but I'm gonna to refer to hard and soft fields to so that some of the ways that, that language choices um, are related to disciplinary understandings. So this table, for example, shows a few of these differences based on an analysis of 240 research articles um, of around one point, uh, one and a half million words from the 10 leading journals in eight disciplines. Now, most predictably, probably, we find that authors in the soft knowledge fields intrude into their disciplines through the use of I or we almost three times more frequently than scientists. Now, this allows them to claim authority through personal conviction and to emphasize the, the contribution that they're making to that, that discussion. It sends a clear signal of the writer's uh, perspective and it distinguishes that perspective from that of others. But while self-mention can help construct an authoritative author in the humanities, scientists generally downplay their personal role to establish um, the objectivity of what they report uncontaminated by human activity. They're concerned with generalizations rather than individuals. And it's not supposed to matter who, who actually did the research. And this is achieved by distancing the writer from their interpretations in ways that are familiar to most uh, teachers of uh, English. So this is why we teach students um, the passive. Um, 
why we teach dummy it subject. It was found that, it is believed that, it is suggested that. And by attributing agency to inanimate things like tables, graphs, or results. So um, the images demonstrate, the results show in a process uh, called abstract rituals. Now, all this is quite useful to students in the sciences. So by subordinating their voice to the voice of nature, as it were, scientists rely on the persuasive force of um, lab procedures rather than the force of their writing. Similarly, citation uh, practices also differ enormously, twice as common in the soft fields. And this reflects the extent to which writers can assume uh, a shared context with readers. So science, hard sciences in particular, produce public knowledge through really relatively steady cumulative growth. Problems emerge out of uh, previous problems. And this allows writers to rely uh, uh, far more on their readers recovering the significance of the research without extensive referencing. So readers are often doing the same, uh, working on the same problems as uh, the subject of the text. They're familiar with the earlier work. They don't need to be reminded of it. In the humanities and social sciences, on the other hand, research is less direct, the literature is more dispersed, the readership is more heterogeneous and uncertain. So writers can't presuppose um, a shared context to the same extent. They have to build one far more using citations. And this, um, this linearity of research also helps account for uh, the higher proportion of self-citation in the sciences. Um, scientists are constantly building on their previous work far more than in the social sciences, so they, um, they, they refer to their own uh, previous research far more. The table also shows that hedges and boosters index disciplinary practices, both occurring far more frequently in the uh, arts and humanities papers. Okay, as you probably know, um, hedges are devices for which withhold complete uh, commitment to a proposition. They imply that a claim is based on the writer's plausible reasoning rather than certain knowledge. While boosters stress certainty and commitment to statements. Now, because they represent the writer's direct involvement in a text, they're twice as common in the social sciences than in the hard sciences. So hedges indicate the degree of confidence it might be sensible or wise to give a claim, while opening a discursive space which allows readers to uh, dispute interpretation. So if you say something is possible, rather than um, just uh, asserting it, then you're allowing um, readers uh, a, a greater uh, extent to participate and, and question what you're saying. They can dispute interpretations. Now, one reason that these are far more common in the soft fields is that there's less control of variables, um, more diversity of research outcomes, fewer clear bases for accepting claims than in the sciences. So writers can't report research with the same confidence of shared assumptions in the social sciences. They, papers rely far more on recognizing alternative voices. Arguments have to be expressed more cautiously using more hedges. But because methods and results um, are also more open to question in the social sciences, writers use more boosters uh, in some circumstances to establish the, the significance of their work against alternative interpretations. They use forms like uh, definitely, prove, certain, establish, to restrict alternative voices. In the hard sciences though, positivist epistemologies mean that the authority of the individual is really subordinated to the authority of the text. Facts are supposed to speak for themselves. This means that writers often disguise their interpretive activities behind linguistic objectivity. Scientists put a greater weight on the 
on the procedures, um, the methods, the equipment that they used to get results rather than the argument. So this suggests that the results will be the same whoever conducted the research. So less frequent use of um, hedges and boosters is one way of minimizing the writer's presence in the text. Um, if, if you're not doing this evaluation, if you're not hedging and boosting, you're, you're, you're stepping out, outside the text and letting the, the results speak. But where um, scientists do hedge, they tend to prefer modals rather than cognitive verbs. This is because, <clears throat> excuse me, modals can more easily combine with inanimate uh, subjects to downplay the person making the evaluation. So it's it's harder to see that uh, the, the writer here in these hedges. So we find more statements like like this in the in the hard sciences. And we find um, more explicitly personal forms to hedge statements in the social sciences. This could this seems sensible. They were probably, we believe it might have been. So modal sense are one way of helping to reinforce a view of science as an impersonal, inductive enterprise, while allowing scientists to see themselves as discovering the truth rather than as, as constructing it through language. The final feature I just briefly want to mention are directives. Um, this really refers to uh, the extent to which succinctness is uh, and precision are valued or even possible. So directives instruct uh, the reader to perform an action or to see things in a way determined by the writer. Um, they're expressed through imperatives like um, consider, note, imagine, and obligation modals, must, have to, ought to, and so on. They direct readers to three main kinds of activity. So textual acts direct readers to another part of the text or to another text altogether. So C. Smith, look at table two. Physical acts direct readers how to carry out some action in the real world. We obviously often find these in, in method sections. And cognitive acts instruct readers how to interpret an argument, explicitly positioning them by getting readers to, um, to note, uh, concede, consider some uh, argument in the text. Now these um, directives are not only more frequent in the science text, but function differently. So while directives are represent a writer's direct involvement in a text, that it's a writer stepping into the text to telling the reader how to do something. They're more common in the sciences, and this is because they're a highly uh, risky tactic, because they instruct readers how to how to um, act or, or, or to see things in a certain way. So 60% of directives in the soft fields are um, textual. They direct readers to a reference or a table rather than telling them how they should interpret an argument. So these kinds of um, examples are very common. Those in the sciences, on the other hand, largely guide readers explicitly through an argument. They emphasize what the reader should attend to, the way they should understand what's being said. So examples like this are very frequent. And this is because, again, of the linear problem-oriented um, nature of the natural sciences, which enables research to occur within a highly um, established framework. So arguments can be formulated in a standardized code, which presupposes a lot of background. It's also, uh, directives are also useful in, in, in reducing the amount of words that are needed. So succinctness is, is highly valued by journal editors who have a bias to publish stance, unlike humanities and social sciences. Um, they're trying to publish as much as they can. If the method looks fine, then they will publish it. Um, succinctness is also valued by uh, information-saturated scientists who um, 
who really read for the bottom line to see the relevance of the research to their own work. And directives then allow writers to cut directly to the heart of matters, while arguments in the soft fields need to be more elaborate, more discursive, more, more clearly spelt out. Another major disciplinary difference is the expectations and attitudes that tutors have towards writing and towards feedback. Um, now, while subject teachers might argue that uh, English teachers lack the subject knowledge to teach uh, disciplinary specific language, many English teachers feel that uh, subject teachers are not interested in teaching uh, literacy skills. And I looked at this in a study at Hong Kong U a few years ago, um, where I found broad differences looking at the attitudes and practices um, of 20 academics, five from each of four faculties comprising eight disciplines. Now, all 20 of these um, teachers set writing assignments, um, always as assessment and often as the only assessment. But soft knowledge tutors were agreed that this isn't, wasn't just a matter of quality control, but of developing skills of disciplinary argument. Um, this history professor put this very well. He said that writing is absolutely key. It embodies the discipline, the main discipline product. His, uh, teaching history is about teaching students to write. What I expect them to gain ultimately, as well as the ability to express themselves, is the ability to engage more effectively with, um, with discourses in the past. You can't do that unless you can articulate precisely what the discourse means. And similarly, a business uh, professor said, I think writing is very important. It reflects the ways which students structure and express their thoughts. So I'm less concerned about correct spelling and grammar. What I'm very concerned about is teaching them to write logical essays, which takes a research question and address it in a structured and thoughtful way with evidence and logical conclusions. Now, for teachers in the sciences, um, writing seemed less important. And the fact that teachers and the, the fact that students were writing in um, a second language, a foreign language, was often treated as a minor issue. This is an engineering professor. If they have problems with language errors, that means they're not working hard enough. They're 21 years old. Um, I mean, they should have a high level of ability already, not just what they've learned since coming here. When I assess their writing, I have to treat everybody equally. So grade grammar less, a very small percentage, maybe 5%. Looking at the feedback the tutors gave on texts, um, it was it was also different. It was, uh, typically, um, in the sciences, it was less frequent, more cursory, um, just ticks, underlining, question marks, sometimes only just a grade. So the texts um, marked by the science teachers seemed hurriedly checked rather than carefully read. Teachers in the social sciences, um, in contrast, offered more explicit commentary on language. Uh, this is um, the feedback given by a history tutor. My edit here is a classic example of the clarity that can be achieved if you would adopt a subject verb object sentence structure. Check your original and see how this expresses your meaning more clearly. So uh, my, an English teacher might have given that feedback. Um, certainly a business um, teacher. Avoid long sentences. Before you have control over sentence structure, use a single sentence for each point. This will allow readers to see your argument better. So these comments then suggest that writing is largely seen as um, uh, an aspect of, 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 of disciplinary socialization rather than just getting the grammar right. Um, in fact, an English teacher um, English literature teacher says, I suppose my feedback focuses on trying to help them clearly state a claim or idea and then how they can develop it in an appropriate style. So it's about encouraging clarity of thought and clearly defining a question to discuss. 
And of course, this is done very differently in different uh, disciplines. Now, in contrast to these, these angels, tutors in the hard sciences rarely asked for drafts and often gave no feedback. An engineering professor, actually, I don't ask for a draft. Their report is an assignment and they're graded on this. If we give them a chance to write a draft, if we correct a draft, we're just giving a grade to our own work. We don't write their exams for them. So why write their reports? There you are. That's an interesting point of view. Um, and for some of these tutors, particularly in the sciences, setting assignments was a way of seeing if students had um, understood the course and feedback had very doubtful significance. A biology professor, I don't think it makes a lot of difference, to be honest. It all depends on the students. Some students will come and talk about uh, it, the, the, the assignment, and will go away and change it. Some students seem not to care too much. Um, I guess if the students thought it was helpful, more of them would come and ask for feedback. So it, it, it's, it's completely voluntary whether uh, students get feedback or not. In fact, uh, in the sciences, the teachers are often delegated feedback to teaching assistants, um, biology teacher. Students have access to postgraduate demonstrators. I think it's the students' initiative whether they use them, and it's obvious um, that they're the ones who do much better. I think uh, they obviously had some input. And a chemistry teacher, they go to the postgraduates first and then to me if necessary. If the students send them their drafts, then the demonstrator will give them feedback. But this isn't compulsory. It's up to them. So several of these students, uh, of these tutors, um, actually didn't see improving students' disciplinary literacy as their job at all. This is uh, a, an engineering teacher again. How helpful is the written feedback for improving students' work? I've no idea. I don't teach them how to write. They go to academic writing classes, I think. I don't think my feedback would help them to write. So there is this, this divide, but there's also other pressures. And um, uh, one tutor mentioned this very explicitly. Um, we shouldn't fool ourselves. This is a research university where the expectations are quite clear. Research is at the top, teaching is number two, administration is number three. Some of us sometimes feel that administration is number two and teaching at the very bottom. We don't have as much time to help students as we would like. Perhaps specificity is most obvious in the kinds of writing that students are asked to do. I just want to mention this um, very briefly as, as, as the fourth um, and final point about uh, uh, evidence for specificity. Um, different fields obviously value different kinds of writing and set different writing tasks. So in the humanities and social sciences, um, analyzing and synthesizing information from multiple sources is important. While in science and technology, more activity-based skills like describing procedures, defining objects, and planning solutions are needed. We also know that different fields make use of different genres. So in their large-scale uh, corpus study of 30 disciplines, in universities across the UK, Nessie and Gardner found 13 different genre families, ranging from empathy writing, narratives, research reports, problem questions. Um, and these genres differed considerably in their social purpose, in their genre structure, and in the networks that they formed with other genres. So once again, very different kinds of writing uh, in different fields. And even in fairly closely related fields, students write quite different uh, texts. So looking at the uh, um, assignments given to medical students, for example, Jimenez found that nursing and midwifery students were given very different writing assignments, very little overlap at all. So once again, this underlines the different ways that students are assessed and the different expectations um, 
uh, on them for how they should write. So it's clear that disciplinary specificity is a key factor in the use of English at university. We can see disciplines then as, as language using communities. The term really helps us to join writers, texts and readers together. They provide the context in which we learn to communicate and to interpret each other's talk as we gradually acquire the specialised language that we need uh, to succeed and be accepted as group members. This is what Wells said about this back in 1992. Each subject discipline constitutes a way of making sense of human experience that's, involved, that's evolved over generations, and each is dependent on its own particular practices, its instrumental procedures, its criteria for judging relevance and validity, and its conventions of acceptable forms of argument. In a word, each has developed its own modes of discourse. So to work in a discipline, we need to be able to engage in these practices and particularly in its discourses. We need to understand the distinctive ways they have of asking questions, addressing a literature, criticizing ideas, presenting arguments, so that we can help students participate effectively in their learning. Okay, I want to turn to practice now on a couple of quick examples um, uh, of how we approach specificity uh, a few years ago at Hong Kong U with English in the Discipline uh, courses. And the two examples I'm going to show you um, indicate that specif specificity can vary hugely. So what you can do often depends very much on the cooperation of influential individuals in faculties willing to um, collaborate with you. So some um, faculty members are happy to improve their students' disciplinary literacy by working with language units. Others think we should be teaching uh, Shakespeare to their engineers or even better to stay well away from their students altogether uh, to give them more time to, to study maths or law or whatever it is. Okay, the first example then is um, uh, the business faculty um, wanted just one course for all its eight majors. So we thought the best thing that we could do to help students in this situation was um, to uh, provide them with ways to analyze and evaluate texts to discover criteria for good writing. So what does a, what does a good text look like in, in business? So these, um, um, the course has two writing assignments in the genres that are common across all eight uh, majors in business, case studies and reports. And a third assignment, which assesses what students have learned from the course by asking them to compare the two genres. Now the classes um, are flipped with the input occurring before each session through a mini lecture accessed by the students on the course Moodle. It's designed to get them to reflect on a topic, um, and this then forms the basis of class discussions. After class, students work on assignments and follow-up exercises. So I want to show you now, if it works, a two-minute uh, mini-lecture from early in the course, which tries to help students understand that texts have similar uh, um, patterns of organisation, but avoids giving them prescriptive models to follow. So before the video, uh, students will have written uh, an academic genre and begun to evaluate its quality in collaboration with the teacher and peers. They watch the video before class, they can pause it, make notes, write questions, and this finishes up with a couple of questions to get discussion going uh, in the class. After the uh, video, uh, students are encouraged to apply what they've heard to text samples, helping them to evaluate text. They then collaboratively, collaboratively construct a text um, while evaluating its quality. Okay, let's watch the video. Oh, I'm terribly sorry.
In the rationale for the course, we talked about developing evaluative capabilities as key to lifelong learning. In this short video, the focus is on one key aspect of language awareness that you need to develop to become a skilled writer. That is genre awareness. Before knowing how to develop your genre awareness, we need to know what a genre is. Most of you will be familiar with film genres such as horror, romantic comedy or thrillers. These are types or classes of film. In most cases, we can work out what genre of film we're watching from the start of the film. Horror films, for example, typically begin at night and or in poor weather. They have very dramatic music and often begin with very little dialogue. In most cases, we can instantly identify the horror genre. because We're very aware of what goes into such a film. Now, it's very unlikely that you'll be directing or producing films in your future job, but you will very likely be expected to write in a variety of textual genres. In the workplace, these may include reports, memos, emails, and while at university, essays, reports, and case analyses. So now we know what a genre is, how can we develop genre awareness? Developing genre awareness means becoming aware of how certain texts are similar in their structure and organization, in how content is dealt with, and how vocabulary, sentence structure, and tone are used. Developing this awareness means noting what skilled writers are doing with content and how they're expressing content. By making this noticing explicit, you can discover guidelines for writing similar texts yourself in the future. So genre awareness gives you criteria for success, which can help you evaluate your own developing text. Good writers are always aware of their audience and purpose, and genre awareness helps us meet the expectations of our audience. However, there is a common misconception about genre. The misconception is that people feel there's an exact prescribed way of writing a text. This is not true. No two films are exactly alike, as different actors, directors and scriptwriters make big differences to the overall film. In texts, different forces act on genres. Centripetal forces are the factors which are typical in any text, but there are always centrifugal forces that operate on texts, such as creativity, writer styles and different audience expectations. These forces mean that no two texts are exactly alike. So a big part in developing your evaluative capabilities is to become more aware of genre and to notice features of language that good writers use. Becoming better at noticing and becoming more genre aware are vital for helping you develop as a skilled writer who can write different texts in different genres that meet the expectations of their various audiences. Now, here are some questions for you. Okay, so the um, after the video, it ends with a couple of questions, a reflective question, um, so that students just two or four, so they can go back and view. Um, and a question which um, asks them to really be a bit more analytical in their thinking and identify uh, some features of a genre which they're familiar with. So um, this is a... Um, um, a course which is uh, specific to business, but not specific to a particular major. The second example I want to show you is uh, the course for English for Clinical Pharmacy, which is a highly specific third year course focusing on common spoken and written genres in drug information, developed in close collaboration with the medical faculty. Now, early in the course here, we teach um, specific words and strategies for learning new terms. But learning is mainly through a drug information project jointly um, devised with the pharmacy department. So drug um, evaluation is a basic part of a pharmacist's career. Many of the documents that, um, that the pharmacists write are based on some form of drug evaluation. So then students working in pairs evaluate and recommend two drugs that can be used to treat the same medical condition. Um, to make this exercise meaningful, the drugs assigned are selected by the pharmacy department. The pharmacy department also advised on the writing task, uh, a hospital bulletin article. Uh, this is a common genre for clinical pharmacists who are working in a hospital. Now this worksheet is from uh, towards the end of the course. Students work in pairs on an article to identify the moves and compare and compare uh, findings with another pair looking at another text. They then go on to see which aspects of drug information are included in the study um, and evaluate 
uh, and, and look at um, evalu evaluative and comparative language. So the project then provides an opportunity for learners to develop and practice useful and highly special uh, disciplinary specific um, research and academic writing skills. The involvement of pharmacy tutors in this, uh, in particularly in designing and co-assessing the course, helps ensure motivation and authenticity. Okay, I want to conclude um, by saying I'm a bit less dogmatic about specificity than I used to be, um, but I still believe that we need to get as close to what students need as we possibly can. Um, this is because the ways of that we use language um, are situated in domains of knowledge and ways of talking about knowledge which differ across disciplines. Now I've been talking about specificity for 20 years but uh, Ballard and Clenchy's point from the 1980s is well worth repeating. Just as modes of analysis vary with disciplines and with the groups that practice them, physicists, psychologists, literary critics, so too does language. For the student new to a discipline, the task of learning uh, the language, uh, the task of learning the distinctive mode of analysis is indivisible from the task of learning the language of the discipline. So one area of development cannot proceed without the other. So I think the bottom line really of all this is that academic English is not an extension of everyday English and the EAP is not it's really nothing to do with, with topping up a, a, a deficit of generic language skills that students haven't um, acquired at, at, at school. Instead, EAP is about developing new kinds of literacy, equipping students with the communicative skills that they need to participate in particular academic cultures. And we should take uh, specificity very seriously as a consequence. Goodbye. Thanks very much for coming. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Thank you.